have. The questions you have asked and the advice you have given is enlightening to us. Every time we come to parliamentary committees, we don't just come to shed light or give uh, you know, opinions. Much of what we get from our interactions <laughs> with members of parliament also informs uh, our development of policy as we go along. Because as I said earlier, we have a collective responsibility jointly uh, to, to manage the country. Parliament is as much government as the executive branch and as, 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 as the judiciary. So uh, rather than going to question after question, Mr. Chairman, sir, with your kind permission, I will summarize by making about five points that will address most of the issues that were raised. On the issue of the media and how the media was uh, uh, handled or what happened with the media at the airport, I want to tell you this as a honest public servant. I don't shirk, I don't hide. I am the Cabinet Secretary for Interior and Coordination of National Government. Responsibilities and everything that happens in security, the buck stops at my desk. I take responsibility for what happens. So I would not like anybody to be blamed. The police, immigration, they all work in my ministry. I am their minister. I take responsibility for whatever happens. That is why I have responsibly uh, required of the Internal Affairs Unit of the police and the IPOA to look into what happened at the airport so that we actually get to the bottom of the matter. And I promise you, honorable members, when we go to our retreat, because we have a retreat pending, I will discuss this in some level of detail because it's a matter that we need to address ourselves as responsible people. I have described it as unfortunate. It's an incident or something that we would not like to happen. And we've held conversations many times with, with, with the leaders of the, of the media. You know very well, we, we in part of my history and service in government, I was minister for uh, uh, ICT in terms of the media. We have the largest number of uh, foreign reporters operating out of Nairobi. We are essentially an example of media freedom. Media freedom is our way of life in Kenya. That does not mean that we don't come across situations where we have challenges. And I will be the first to admit, we do have challenges, and we will always have them. Sometimes where we have misunderstandings, or sometimes where we feel that our reporters and our media practitioners have been uh, uh, treated in a manner that they ought not to be treated. That is exactly why we need to be constantly conversing. And I will constantly reach out to the senior editors where there are issues, so that we resolve them as we go along. I don't want them to feel that there is a plan, a policy, or a decision on the part of the Ministry or the Security Sector to harass them. There isn't. We want to work with them, and we will continue to work with them. Only that I will ask this, because it's related to what many of you have asked. Honorable Kateri talked about PR, and many of you have talked about PR. I would also like to request our brothers and sisters, our colleagues, our fellow citizens who are in the press, to also be sometimes mindful. There are times we feel that we are given less attention and the things we say are given less attention. I will confirm to you here on record that throughout last week when this Biguna business was happening, our head of communication, Manamwenda Njoka and uh, Wangoi, issued communication daily on what had happened with the migration. But that was not covered or given as much prominence as the drama that was playing out uh, at the airport. Biguna is, uh, was born in this country. Uh, he is one of us. Like a responsible government, we actually can't develop an attitude towards our own people, as it were. It's just that we require that all of us uh, live by the law that we have decided we are going to live by. <laughs> it's as simple as that. We don't think the gentleman is a problem. In fact, we fear that he may be a big problem to himself, more than to anyone else uh, in this world. So, so we will do whatever it takes to, to support him, however he will be needed so that he is less of a problem to himself, because that, I think, is the, is, is the worry that any government would have, as it were. Secondly, on the, there is an issue I would like to speak to uh, very passionately from my heart, and this is the issue of interbranch relations, relations between the judiciary, the executive, parliament, and so on. Honorable members, many of those democracies we admire are 100, 200 years old, and if you spoke to those who have studied them, they will tell you nation building is a painstaking and long journey. We've started. I want to confirm to you here again on record, as government, we respect the judiciary. We will obey all court orders without exception, all of them. And we will do as we are directed by the courts. All we are asking is that let us not pay so much attention to the check side. Let us also pay attention to the balance side. Because it's supposed to be of checks and balances, so that we don't overreach. You know, judicial overreach can be as harmful as executive branch overreach, or as legislative overreach, as it were. So that if we go beyond, because for example, uh, if you are able to give expert orders on firearms, for example, 
and the firearms and licensing board has got the professionals who can analyze and say Honorable Ngunjiri has posed particular challenges, let us suspend his firearm licenses. But then you overrule, overrule that and you don't have tools to review his situation. The person who has the tools to review the situation is the firearms and licensing board. Now, th then you are going a little bit beyond you know, where you're supposed to be. It's good enough for you to say, after I've reviewed Honorable Ngujiri's application, I think he was not treated fairly. Then ask us to treat him differently. But you see, when you make uh, you know, a complete determination and you throw us off balance, there is a little bit of going beyond you know, where we are supposed to be. And that overreach hurts balance. But I can assure you, we respect the judiciary, we will continue to work with the judiciary. We also worry, as much as you do, because when a judge makes an order stopping us from collecting tax, then the Judicial Service Commission will go to the Treasury for money. So, surely, do you see the relationship? I mean, where are we? Because that tax is how we will get money that the Treasury will give you to manage the Judicial Service Commission. We all need to have this, uh, you know, patient engagement with each other. My suggestion, and we have talked about this with colleagues in the ministry, is constant engagement and constant discussions with the leaders of the judiciary and constant interactions and a very positive attitude. You know, honorable members, this problem, 50% of it will be solved by attitude, a positive attitude. You know, having a positive attitude that says, these are my brothers, they may have a point, let me listen to them. An attitude only can solve most of this issue. So even you as our honorable members of parliament and leaders in the legislative arm of government, maybe through your committees, you'll begin a new system where you have more interaction with the judiciary, more engagement, uh, so that we can understand each other, reduce the friction, so that we can move the country forward. And when they have made decisions, I can assure you we will respect the decision, except that we also need now to intensify our engagement but there is no problem. I can tell you this. I don't think there's a problem in the nature in which people think between the executive branch and the judiciary. There could be a few judicial officers, as I said, and they probably will not number more than five. There are a few judicial officers and so on. And as I said earlier, we, the law requires us that we go through our bridge. Our bridge is the attorney general. Even the challenges we have right now on this particular matter, we have presented a petition to the attorney general. The attorney general will take it to the Judicial Service Commission on those judicial officers and the Judicial Service Commission will decide and guide us how we will go. The ones we have with the Law Society of Kenya, we have again presented to the, law, the Attorney General. The Attorney General will write to the Law Society of Kenya. I think that is the orderly way in which we can operate. We can't go out there shouting at them and so on and so forth. We will try to be as orderly as we can. What we are bleeding for as we go along is that a measure of responsibility on each of us and we will have to continue engaging. Lastly, but uh, not the least, on the issue of the Canadian High Commission. I feel constrained to say this because it would be unfair if I left this without saying it. We enjoy a very strong relationship with the Canadian government and the people and the nation. We have a very strong relationship. I am aware and you know honorable members. We will tell you in more details, for example, the Canadian government support to the efforts of UNHCR and the activities that uh, you know we are doing in terms of uh, dealing with refugees and so on. We have huge development programs with the Canadian government. We enjoy a fantastic relationship. Our colleagues in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs have done very well. And if you look at this issue, by the way, at every turn and bend, they have been 100% responsive. When we called them on the matter, they were able to extend consular services to Miguna Miguna. And they have been made in communication with us as we go along. I wouldn't actually get to a point of requiring them to explain. I would manage relations differently by working with them because they are already they themselves are also suffering as much as we are suffering on this issue because when you have your three con uh, consular officials at the airport begging this guy and telling him hey you know, so wh what less have they done than we did i mean we've worked very well and they've been very helpful and cooperative and we'll continue to work with them the canadian high commissioner has been fantastic in working with my colleagues at the minister of foreign affairs so, so we we'll leave it at that. I would not make any demands on them more than what has already happened, as it were. We'll continue working together, and you know there are so many of our people who are in Canada right now. Some have applied to regularize their citizenship, and we will continue working with them on the scholarship program, on education, and all those issues that we work with the Canadian government. Lastly, I want to urge you as a committee, because uh, you are our front desk to Parliament, because it's through you that we come to Parliament. And it's through you, therefore, we engage with others. I would like to ask you that both now and as we continue in the future, we'll continue discussing some of the things we need to do to support the security sector. 
uh, our inspector general and his team do a fantastic job. That does not mean that they will not have challenges or issues. When they do, we find a way of resolving them for the good of our country as we go forward. So I wouldn't blame police officers and say they have done this or they have done that. Movement of police officers is a routine thing and it happens all the time. It has, I don't think the movement of Mr. Ndoro from the port had anything to do with what happened last week. The Inspector General, you know from January, you have observed yourselves from January. He has been actually uh, moving officers around who have served X number of years and so on, and it continues. It will happen tomorrow, it will happen the day after and so on. I don't want a police officer who is senior like that to feel that he is being punished or so on. It will demoralize our people. These are our brothers and sisters. These are people in the line of duty. They do a fantastic job. Where challenges are there, we come together and cross ranks and deal with them as we have dealt with this one. Lastly, Mr. Chairman, on my own behalf and on behalf of my colleagues from the ministry, we are very grateful once again for the time that you have given us. We are very grateful for your understanding and we promise that we will be available. Of course, we are bound by the requirements of the Constitution to be accountable and to come to you. Anytime it requires to be before you on an issue of this kind or any other in our sector, we will willingly do that and thank you so much. Mr. Chairman, if it may please you, I think I need to clarify this and I said earlier, we have gone to the Court of Appeal on that decision. And again, in that same vein of respecting court decisions and court orders, I don't want to discuss the matter here when it's already before the court. Because the next thing I'm going to be told is again I'm being contemptuous of the same court because the matter has gone to court at the moment. It's a live issue as we speak right now in the Court of Appeal.
that members we need to engage, we need to support, uh, so that this land moves. Look at the economy of the country. Thank you. I want to point out one. I think this is problem. Mr. Chairman, when he sits in this committee, he is not like opposition. These are matters of national interest. Yeah. And we are saying, if we are with our Mr. Chairman, I would want to see him to put a seat in the way he is seated. And here is the side of the story that can be built here. Now, we have not even exhausted the mechanism of the community. Let's restrain ourselves from being opposed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. I also want to thank the media. I also want to thank my secretary. I want to thank the media. Thank you. 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 Thank for your consistent support. The questions you have asked and